This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. High stakes. Tomorrow's employment report takes on added importance as investors try to determine whether the labor market is healthy or has in fact lost its mojo. Milk Money, a French yogurt maker, makes its biggest acquisition in almost a decade, and it's putting its faith in the fast-growing market for organic foods. Age discrimination? Google has publicly addressed gender and racial imbalance in its workforce. Now a lawsuit alleges another issue. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, July 7th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Anticipation is high. The release of the monthly jobs report is always important, of course. But tomorrow's taking on added significance, not just to Wall Street, but to Main Street and Washington as well. Hiring in May showed its weakest gain in more than five years. The anemic report shocked just about everybody, and it cemented the Federal Reserve's decision not to raise interest rates. Then came another surprise, the Brexit. And tomorrow's report will, deter will determine whether May's weak showing was an anomaly or the start of a new and worrying trend for what has been one of the strongest parts of the economy. So here's what's expected. Consensus is for non-farm payrolls to rise 165,000. The unemployment rate may tick higher to 4.8 percent. And average hourly earnings are expected to gain 0.2 percent. Two new pieces of data point to a strengthening labor market and could bode well for that uh, report tomorrow. Payroll processor ADP released its, its monthly report showing the creation of 172,000 private sector jobs last month. Part of the gain is due to small businesses ramping up hiring. In a separate report, the Labor Department said initial claims for unemployment benefits fell 16,000 last week, and that drop puts jobless claims close to a 43-year low. So let's turn now to Anthony Chan for more on what he's expecting from tomorrow's jobs report. He is chief economist with Chase. Anthony, good to see you again. Welcome. Great to be here. What are you expecting tomorrow? I'm looking for a number that's north of 170,000. As you mentioned, that ADP report was very encouraging. Last month, as you are well aware, uh, that report actually uh, exaggerated uh, the, uh, the strength uh, and missed uh, the forecast by almost 150,000. I don't think that'll happen two months in a row. That report was strong again this month. I think it'll show up in the payrolls numbers. So what happened last month? Why was it so low, 38,000? What went wrong? Well, the ADP report sometimes has a little bit of a spotty record. We also had the Verizon strike that basically subtracted about 35,000 workers. They are not counted on in payrolls when they're on strike. This month, they're back, back to work. So you got to add another 35,000. That's another reason to expect more strength. But before we panic, we know the Federal Reserve tells us all you need is about 100,000 or so jobs being created every single month just to absorb the natural growth in the labor force. So any number north of 100,000 is, is actually good news. You know, Anthony, broadening it out a little bit, how important is this report to the Federal Reserve in light of the fact that we have some financial turmoil with the Brexit? We also have oil prices that really have been hit hard, especially in today's trading session, and interest rates are hitting new lows. This is a very important report, and the reason for that is, if you look at the FOMC minutes, uh, you can see uh, quite a bit of anxiety on the part of the Federal Reserve officials because of that employment report. So they almost absolutely need to see this number recovering and be above 100,000. My suspicion is it'll be a lot stronger than that. And they also need to see wages picking up mm -hmm. because consumer spending is going to be very robust in the second quarter. And they want to know that that sort of robust pace of consumer spending, that's two-thirds of the economy, continues well into the second half. Given the Brexit concerns, everybody knows it's going to be a hit to United Kingdom growth. It's going to be a hit to Eurozone growth and less of a hit to the U.S. But nonetheless, it will be a hit. So we need to see other things working a lot better. So I, I know this isn't your isn't your forecast, and I, and I hesitate to ask you about something that you don't think is going to happen, but I'm going to do it nonetheless. Uh, what if this number comes in below that hundred thousand figure? Is more in line with the prior month? How worried would you be about the U.S. economy in that case? Well, in that case, I would be very concerned about the economy. We know that if you start to get one number on top of another number mm -hmm. that suggests weakness, you have to worry. But remember, those initial unemployment claims, when you look at that four-week moving average during the week that the government takes a survey, were much lower than in the prior month. That's usually right. consistent, which is a much stronger number. And guess what? 
Even this week's initial unemployment claims were even lower. And that would suggest that not tomorrow's number, but even the next month's number is actually going to show additional I love a vigorous strength. economist. Man, <laughs> Anthony, you come back any time, my friend. <laughs> that is great. We love enthusiasm on NBR. And Anthony, passion. thank you so much. Thank you. Anthony Chan with Chase. Love that. Whoa. All right, on Wall Street, stocks weighed down by a drop in pr crude prices, finished mixed ahead of the June jobs report. Not even a deal in the food sector could increase the buying. More on that acquisition in just a moment. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was off 22 points to 17,895. The Nasdaq was up 17, and the S&P 500 fell slightly to 2097. Meantime, oil prices tumbled about 5% to a two-month low after government data showed a smaller-than-expected weekly decline in crude oil inventories. So now on to that food deal we just mentioned. Paris-based Danone has agreed to, be, to acquire organic food maker White Wave for about $10 billion. That sent shares of White Wave, which owns brands like Silk, Horizon, and Earthbound, up more than 18 percent. And as Sarah Eisen reports, the food industry is seeing an increase in merger activity. Another food company is in the shopping bag, White Wave, which makes Horizon Milk and Earthbound getting scooped up by French yogurt giant Danone. Why? Well, it doubles Danone's U.S. business and gives it access to fast-growing brands and growth, something food and beverage companies have been starving for. The problem? Consumer tastes have changed. The economy globally is challenging, and innovation in this area has been hard to come by. So large companies are either buying small, faster-growing rivals like Danone and White Wave, or they're going at it alone, ramping up their innovation machines, hoping to grow by launching new products that match millennial tastes. That's certainly Pepsi's strategy. A lot of food and beverage companies are struggling for growth, and they're trying to reshape their portfolios to hit their expectations. Over the last 10 years, we've reshaped our portfolio already to be consistent with expectations. Pepsi's new products have helped, but others have been voraciously buying. Within the last two years alone, General Mills scooped up Annie's, think organic cheddar bunnies. Heinz swallowed up Kraft to combine two big companies to gain scale and cut costs. Snyder's bought Diamond Foods, known for its almonds, for nearly $2 billion. Pinnacle bought Boulder Brands, which makes Smart Balance and Glutino in November. So what's next? Oreo maker Mondelez recently bid for Hershey, which rejected the deal, but many still say could be on the table, and that would be one of the largest ever in the food industry. As far as fast-growing, organic, and healthy companies left, many are looking at Haynes Celestial, which own all sorts of healthy brands like Arrowhead Mills, Health Valley, Imagine Soups. But those healthy food companies are becoming harder and harder to come by in this growing age of food consolidation. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Sarah Eisen. Shares of Humana dropped sharply on reports the Department of Justice plans to meet to discuss Humana's deal with Aetna. This is according to Reuters. Antitrust regulators have significant concerns over the proposed acquisition. Officials will reportedly meet tomorrow with both insurers to discuss whether the deal will limit consumer choices for Medicare health plans for the elderly. Aetna announced its uh, intention to buy Humana about a year ago. Humana shares fell 9.5% on the trade today. Aetna also lower by almost 4%. And another health insurance deal is being questioned. The Connecticut Attorney General is raising concerns about the proposed Anthem Cigna takeover. George Jepson says that if the acquisition wins federal approval, it could hurt competition in the industry and lead to higher prices for consumers. Cigna is based in Connecticut. And according to the Hartford Current, Jepson's office is about two weeks away from wrapping up a review of the tie-up. On Capitol Hill, the director of the FBI was at the center of a heated hearing today. James Comey staunchly defended his decision not to not recommend criminal charges against Hillary Clinton for her use of a private email server while she was secretary of state. But that did not satisfy some lawmakers. Hampton Pearson watched it all. And nothing but the truth. It was a marathon on Capitol Hill for FBI Director James Comey, the, the defending the decision not to bring criminal like. charges against Hillary Clinton for her use of a private email server while Secretary of State. Again and again, Comey told lawmakers Clinton's conduct was careless but not negligent, and there's only been one case in the last century where charges were levied. No reasonable prosecutor would bring this case. No reasonable prosecutor would bring the second case in 100 years focused on 
gross negligence. Oversight Committee Chairman Jason Chaffetz pushed back, asking repeatedly if Hillary Clinton had lied during the investigation. Did Hillary Clinton lie? To the FBI? We have no basis to conclude she lied to the FBI. Did she lie to the public? That's a question I'm not qualified to answer. I can speak about what she said to the FBI. And Comey strongly challenged the charge. Hillary Clinton got special treatment. I just want the American people to know we really did this the right way. You can disagree with us, but you cannot fairly say we did it in any kind of political way. We don't carry water for anybody. And there's this reaction from the Hillary Clinton campaign. A statement says, despite the partisan motivations, they are glad the hearing took place and that Director Comey's explanations shuts the door on any lingering conspiracy theories. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hampton Pearson on Capitol Hill. Ms. Clinton's campaign may say the door is shut on any remaining conspiracy theories, but no one thinks the case is closed. John Harwood comes to us from Washington tonight. So, John, they think that the door is shut on this and the case is closed. Is it? Well, it's shut legally. Loretta Lynch says she will uh, accept the recommendations of the uh, FBI investigators on this. Now, Jason Chaffetz did indicate today that he was going to try to send a referral to the FBI for a perjury case against Secretary Clinton. We'll see whether the uh, department picks up that invitation to investigate that. I suspect they may not. Uh, but in any case, this political issue is going to stay alive all the way through November because of the strength of the criticisms that James Comey had about her carelessness in handling classified information. Let's talk a little bit about the Republican reaction to the hearing today and in light of this sort of non-indictment, indictment, if you will, of, of Ms. Clinton. It would seem that Republicans uh, and Mr. Trump should be able to agree that this is a, a fruitful path uh, to run against Mrs. Clinton. Did they come together or was this meeting somewhat fractious? Uh, the, there were two meetings, actually, and his meeting with the House, they did come together. Uh, members were very positive coming out of the meeting. Paul Ryan gave a statement saying that we're united in our resolve to defeat Hillary Clinton. So Hillary Clinton, there's no question, is a binding agent, a unifying mm -hmm. force for Donald Trump, helping him pull Republicans behind him. There have been some complaints, though, from Republicans about Mr. Trump. That's right, and we heard some of those in the Senate meeting. So first he goes to the House, has a meeting that was very positive. Our own Larry Kudlow introduced him at that meeting and said that he felt uh, members were coming together. Uh, but in the second meeting in the Senate, you saw Jeff Flake, senator from Arizona, colleague of John McCain, the former uh, Vietnam prisoner of war, stand up and say, I'm the one who wasn't captured. I'm the senator who wasn't ca captured. He and uh, Donald Trump had a sharp exchange. He suggested that uh, Jeff Flake may be in political trouble for distancing himself from him. Flake reminded him he's not up for re-election this year. So there's still some tension points, and uh, Donald Trump has work to do to pull the entire party behind him from leadership level to rank and file. It's going to keep being as interesting as it has been all along. John, thanks so much. John Harwood in Washington. Still ahead, just how rampant is age discrimination in tech-focused Silicon Valley? Federal investigators now want to know. U.S. airlines have tentatively been awarded flights to Havana. They could start as early as this fall. The airlines named by the Department of Transportation are United Continental, Delta, American, JetBlue, Alaska, Frontier, Southwest, and Spirit. These tentative plans are expected to be completed this summer. The move is the next step in restoring diplomatic ties with Cuba. A case of the munchies helps lift results at Pepsi, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. Strong demand for the company's Frito-Lay snacks, as well as new drinks like Propel flavored water, helped the company top earnings estimates. As a result, Pepsi raised its guidance for the year. Shares of PepsiCo briefly hit an all-time high of $109 per share before pulling back and ending up nearly 1.5% to 107.49.
Wendy's said customers' financial information was compromised at more than 1,000 franchise-owned restaurants during a malware attack the fast food chain first reported earlier this year. The company said hackers were able to steal cardholders' names, credit card numbers, and expiration dates. Shares of Wendy's were down $0.08 cents to $9.55. Same store sales over at Costco topped street estimates. Sales in June remained flat at the giant retailer, but that was still better than the 1.5% drop that analysts were expecting. Shares of Costco rose nearly 5% on the news to 163.70. June was a good month at the retailer L Brand. Same store sales rose more than expected as the operator of Victoria's Secret and Bath and Body Works said results were lifted by the timing of the Memorial Day and July 4th holidays. But despite the beat, L Brands forecast sales for July to remain flat or to decline into the low single digit growth zone. Shares fell 1.5% to 67.43. Paychex to raise its quarterly dividend. The payroll software maker will hike its dividend 10% to 46 cents a share, up from 42. Uh, in addition, the company will launch a $350 million share buyback program. Paychecks down marginally on the trade today to $60.59. The antivirus technology maker Avast Software will buy rival AVG Technologies for more than a billion. Avast said the merger will allow it to make more personal security products and increase its geographical presence. Shares of AVG surged more than 30% to 24.58. And the FDA has put a clinical hold on a Juno Therapeutics drug trial. This after some patients died. The news is a big blow to Juno Therapeutics and its use of genetically engineered white blood cells to treat adult leukemia patients. Shares fell more than 25 percent initially in after hours trading as you see on that graphic. San Francisco is ground zero for the so-called gig economy, which is made up of independent workers who can work where they want and when they want. But the big shift that's happening in the nation's labor market with the creation of on-demand workers isn't happening in the city that started it all. Josh Lipton has our story. Here in San Francisco, startups are upending and redefining entire industries, from travel to food delivery to home services. But online platforms aren't having a big impact on one area, the workforce of San Francisco. That's the conclusion of a new report from Ted Egan, the city's chief economist. As of 2014, he found that about 30 percent of workers in San Francisco were either self-employed or working less than 35 hours per week. That's roughly the same number as in 2000. In other words, startups that rely on contractors to deliver food or clean homes haven't significantly changed the overall job landscape. Egan says that's because, in part, many of these startups are still relatively young. But it's also because the San Francisco economy is strong. Our unemployment rate is less than 3 percent, and jobs are very plentiful here for people who want them. And so you don't have a situation where people are forced into self-employment as much as you may have in other places where the economies are not as strong. More recent data corroborate Egan's conclusions. The J.P. Morgan Chase Institute last year found that just 5 percent of workers in the San Francisco area derive income from online platforms, a small percentage, though larger than other cities. Of course, there are some sectors where there has been an uptick in self-employment. Transportation, for example, has been impacted by ride-hailing apps like Uber and Lyft. And looking ahead, Egan says he would expect the gig economy to have more of an impact on the job market here as these startups continue attracting new users and the contractors who serve them. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton in San Francisco. Silicon Valley's tech giant Google is under fire for its employment practices. According to a lawsuit filed in a California federal court, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, is investigating multiple complaints filed against the company for age discrimination in hiring. But does this go beyond Google? Joanna Leahy is a professor of economics at Texas A&M University's Bush School of Government and Public Service. And Joanna joins us now. Joanna, welcome. Good to have you with us. Uh, from what you know, does Silicon Valley, broadly speaking, have an ageism problem? In other words, that they don't hire enough folks uh, who are above, say, 40 uh, or promote or maybe a little too quick to fire them? 
Uh, well, it's it's hard to say for sure. Uh, if uh, Silicon Valley specifically has uh, an age problem, it's generally thought that it does. Um, the fact that the workforce is so young uh, might indicate that. What about this EEOC investigation? It seems to me that they wouldn't be investigating um, unless they thought there really was something going on at Google that perhaps needs to be rectified. A absolutely. Um, uh, the EEOC does not Pr uh, prosecute a lot of uh, age discrimination uh, claims um, unless they, you know, think that there uh, really is uh, strong evidence or compelling evidence uh, for a discrimination problem. Um, whether that goes beyond Google, it's hard to say. As I understand this, um, these allegations, it has to do with hiring practices as opposed to promotion practices or firing practices. I would imagine that in a case like this, it is harder to make it or to prove it in cases of hiring than it might be in cases of promotion or firing, where you would have an internal record of the person's performance. Uh, absolutely, that is uh, absolutely correct. Um, uh, it is much easier for firms to uh, discriminate at the hiring level, precisely as you say, because um, there's, there's no record. Um, and so unless uh, people at the hiring stage specifically say something, um, like a smoking gun, like, you know, mm -hmm. oh, we don't hire old people You're or too so old. on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, unless, unless you say something like that, people don't know, are we being, uh, was, did I not get the job because I was not the most qualified person? Or, you know, is there something else going on, like age discrimination? But there were multiple claims of this. So what does that say or allege about the culture at Google? Well, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, on the, on the one hand, it could be that uh, Google does have a, a problem with age discrimination. That would be the most obvious um, uh, answer. But it, it could also be just that, uh, you know, uh, older people are applying to, to Google and they're, they're not getting hired for whatever reason. Um, so uh, this will this will be really interesting to see uh, how the EEOC case plays out. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, either they must think that they have very strong um, evidence, compelling evidence, or uh, they want to send a message to uh, Silicon Valley exactly. uh, to yeah, say, you know, age perhaps. discrimination is not okay. Well, the, um, but we won't really know until uh, the, the lawsuit has been finished. Th this would be the kind of thing that would get other companies' attention, I assume. Absolutely. All right. How are the Aggies going to be this fall, Joanna? <laughs> <laughs> Great as always. All right, good. Joanna Leahy with Texas A&M University's Bush School of Government and Public Service. Coming up, pets bring unconditional love to their owners and big business ideas to entrepreneurs. Here's what to watch tomorrow, folks. As we reported, the employment report for June will be released. Expectations are for an increase of 165,000 non-farm payroll jobs. We'll find out whether consumer borrowing increased or slowed down in May when the Fed releases its monthly consumer credit report. The energy markets will pay attention to the change in the number of active oil rigs. That's what to watch Friday. Mortgage rates have fallen to near record lows. According to the latest Freddie Mac data, the average 30-year fixed rate dropped to 3.41 percent this week. A shift in interest rate expectations, a vote in the U.K. to leave the EU, and a strengthening dollar have all combined to hold Treasury yields low. The yield on the 10-year Treasury is an indicator of whether mortgage rates will rise or fall. When yields drop, so do home loan rates. It's no secret that we spend a lot of money on our pets, right, Miss Sue? Oh, absolutely. Oh, my $5,000 cat surgery. All that spending has <laughs> given rise to a very lucrative industry and has created opportunities for aspiring entrepreneurs. Jane Wells takes a look at some of the hottest trends for our furry friends. Let me smell your breath. We treat our pets like they're humans. In fact, we think they're humans. <gasps> He's going to be your brother. Actually, we love them more than humans. As Universal's The Secret Life of Pets hits theaters, the $60 billion plus pet products industry is lapping up profits and spawning a new wave of entrepreneurs. We make harnesses, dresses, life jackets, backpacks. 
Ronnie DeLulo turned from computer programmer to pet product Titan, creating goggles for dogs called Doggles, used for everything from sun protection to style. It's now a $3 million a year business. Veterinarian Tim Shu has created a line of medical marijuana products for pets, sold in California dispensaries, even though vets cannot prescribe pot for pets yet. That's a good boy. The sky's the limit, really, in this industry, because what we're doing is we're using medical marijuana for very common ailments, you know, pain, arthritis, anxiety, and these are common ailments that we see in the veterinary clinics every day. But no part of the pet industry may be growing faster than insurance. It's going to grow to, uh, I'm thinking, five, six billion dollar industry easy. Rusty Sprout founded Figo Pet Insurance, which not only provides coverage for about $500 a year, but it also has an app which lets owners access their pets' records in the cloud or find pet-friendly businesses. Some reports say right now that one out of every three Fortune 500 companies is offering pet insurance as a supplemental employee benefit. They're contributing and they're, or they're passing on a group discount. With 160 million dogs and cats as pets in America, we've come a long way since the days when Lassie had to sleep outside on a farm. Oh, and by the way, Lassie was the first American pet to get insurance. For Nightly Business Report, Jane Wells, Thousand Oaks, California. Those are her dogs. Jane and her Bassets. Yes, the Princess Leia and Eeyore. All righty. Now you know everything there is to know. They look good in some doggles. 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 That does it for Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for me as well. I'm Tyler Matheson. I'll be wearing my doggles tomorrow. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll see you. I dare you. <laughs>